Father God, thank you for Harry um, and all that he brings to YVV and um, all the experiences and, and things you've poured into him over the years. And just thank you for his time preparing for this message today. And I just ask that um, we would have um, yeah, ears to hear, hear your words through Harry this morning um, and to take them into our coming week. So bless Harry as he speaks to us today. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Good morning. I would like to thank Mr. Carter for preaching my message. <laughs> so it will be quite short this morning. It's such a great thing. And last week, Di preached it as well. So, you know, I've not got a lot to say. Um, and I keep pressing the wrong button and it keeps moving around. I thought Di's message last week was great. It was really a good introduction to Advent. And, you know, I ended up with peace. I have no idea how I ended up with peace. I'm probably the least qualified person at this moment in time to talk about peace. While you guys were ponging around down here a few weeks ago, I was up on the Sunshine Coast catching COVID. When I came back, Liz and I were both ill because I shared it around the family a bit. Um, and since it stopped, up until about two days ago, I have kind of been on the verge of depression. Now, I am not a depressed person, I don't get that way, but for two to three weeks, my energy levels were through the floor in a bad way, and I was on the verge of becoming quite depressed, which I've never done before. I might get it for a couple of hours or a day or something, but it's not something that happens to me. So when I had to come and speak on priests, I came this close to ringing Di and saying, Di, I can't speak. And I thought, no, that's letting the enemy win. I have never, I think once in my life, in 50 years, have I turned down a speaking engagement. So I'm not going to start now. So hold on to your belts and we'll um, <laughs> see where we end up. <laughs> Di mentioned last week, I'm mean, here she just preached my message already, look. Di mentioned last week I was going to talk about the now and not yet. I think it's a doctrine which there is truth in, but I also think it's been misused by the church. We make it an excuse for when people don't get healed or when things don't happen as we expect. But I do think it is very applicable in certain situations. Now, I am a Christian. I am a new creation. But people tell me who know me well that I'm not yet perfect. Now that will happen in the twinkling of an eye when Christ returns. And I'm really looking forward to that, especially getting a new heart. Because this one's, I nearly said a rude word then, this one's not as well as it might be. The other place where I think that doctrine is absolutely true is that the kingdom of God is here. Could you put up the first slide, please? Now, that's the second slide. <laughs> so, I mentioned that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And I want to say that he is the Prince of Peace, that he reigns today. Now, the second slide. Ephesians 1, 18 to 23 says this. In accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ, when he raised him up from the dead and seated him at his right hand, in the heavenly places, far above, not a little bit above, far above, all rule, all authority, and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things, not some things, he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That is an amazing scripture. The Prince of Priests is reigning in this world now. The kingdom has come now. We are living in the kingdom. But we're not yet living in the fullness of it. When we look around, we see wars. There are currently seven major wars raging in this world today. 
and major wars where there's been more than 10,000 people killed. There are 14 minor wars, that's between 1,000 and 10,000 people killed, that are actually continuing today. When we look around, we see poverty, we see famine, we see a lot of things which just aren't right. And you know, this is actually what Jesus said would happen. In Matthew 13, 5 to 8, And Jesus began to say to them, See to it that no one misleads you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am here, and will mislead many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be frightened. These things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places. There will also be famines. These things are merely the beginning of the birth pangs. So we cannot expect peace to suddenly come to this earth because Jesus said that war will continue until he comes again. Similarly, in Luke 17, 26 to 30, it speaks of life going on, you know? And that's what we see. We, we, go, to, we go shopping, we go to school, we get married. We're, we're living just normal lives as well at the same time as the war and the wars are happening. The ones we hear most about are Ukraine and Israel. China also figures quite high and tensions are rising there. And any one of these could tip over into a major escalation. But God isn't concerned. He's actually in control. And I believe his spirit constrains a lot of what is happening. So why doesn't he come back and fix it? Why doesn't he just come back and have the second coming and make it all good? Yeah, it's a really good question, isn't it? I thought it was a good question when I asked myself. And I thought, I don't know. (laughs) But I do have some clues. I think when Christ comes back, the impact of that, the implications of it, the, the change that will happen will be so radical I think it would be almost like creation over again. When Christ comes back in glory, everything is going to change. I love the way Tom Wright puts it, and T. Wright puts it in his books, when he says, when we look at it, and I, I agree totally with what Rob said, we don't know what it's like. We don't really know what the details are and how it's going to feel and what's really going to happen. But N.T. Wright puts it as there are signposts in the Bible. And the signposts point towards something which is really, really good and something amazing. Justice will be seen to be done. Peace will reign. We will enter a new mode of of working and governance and it is going to be amazing. There is some um, confusion, conflict as whether it's going to be this earth renewed or a total new earth. Personally, I suggest it's this earth that is going to be renewed. And Jesus is going to reign. Why doesn't he do it now? I'd like the next slide, please. I discovered this, and this blew my mind. Once Christ comes back, evangelism will cease. As we know it today. The Center for Study for Global Christianity at the Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary, and if you go there, that's a really long name to remember, um, are quite respected in their research and studies into Christian trends. And I was just blown away by some of these figures. 2.6 billion people identify as Christians today in this world. 30% of the population, just over, of the world are Christian, or identify as Christian. By 2050, they reckon it is going to be 3.3 billion, and the largest growth rate is in Africa. They're going great guns. They're having a revival like you wouldn't believe. They reckon there'll be over a billion Christians in Africa by 2050. Asia and South America are closely behind. 
Interestingly enough, Europe has stagnated. And Australia and New Zealand and the States have also kind of have very little growth. And we, but we, you know, as Western Christians, we tend to individualize our Christianity and look just inside us and inside our local community. But when you look at what's happening in the world, at where God is at work in the world, it is totally amazing. In 1900, 95% of Christians lived in Christian countries. So that would be places like Europe, the UK, the US, Australia, and New Zealand. Today, it is 54%. That means that the other 46% are living in, in countries which are not Christian, and not known to be Christian. It means that the, the move of Christianity has moved from a quite a small area to become a global religion. It is actually the biggest religion in the world. I don't like calling it a religion because I don't think it is a religion. In 1900, 54% of, of the population of the world had been unevangelized. That's now down to 28%. And the one figure that blew me away was that in the last 12 months, 44 million 500,000 people had come into the kingdom. I believe that's why Jesus isn't coming back today. There is just such a huge move of God around the world. We're not seeing it particularly in Australia or New Zealand or where we'd normally see it or where we've seen it in the past, but I believe it's going to come back. Something is going to happen in this area. Interestingly, the last 40 years in China, they've gone from 1 million Christians to 100 million Christians. Now, I accept these figures may include nominal Christians as well as what you'd call real Christians. How you tell the difference, I have no idea, and I'm certainly not the person to judge that, because God is much better at doing that than me. So that's why I think Jesus isn't coming back today. We lose that one now. In his sermon a few weeks ago, not the one he did two minutes ago, Mr. Carter said he believed that, as, that YVV was on the cusp of God doing something great and something different here. When a few months ago, when I first got here, I had an accidental prophecy that we would see a trickle coming through the door, and that trickle would grow into a stream, and the church would grow again. And I think we've seen the trickle start. I was at an elders' meeting, um, I don't know how I got there, but I was there um, about three or four weeks ago, and Di was talking about how we were ascending church. Putty Putman had come and prof given a prophecy about us being an ascending church. Now, what he meant was that we brought people up, brought them to maturity, and then sent them out. But me, in my deafness, in my old age, I heard Putty Putman said we were an ascending church, <laughs> that we were going up. And, you know, I, I just sat there. This just pulled a string in my heart. And I sat there for 10 minutes, completely ignoring what they were talking about, thinking, what does it mean to be an ascending church? And I think it means where we are. We're seeing healing. Liz and I have been coming here for a year. We came in first in September last year, and in that year we've seen a difference. There is a change in the atmosphere. There is a change in the, the sense of God in this room. We had a chap come and visit. I don't know where he was from, but somebody mentioned it. And as he walked through the door, he said he felt the presence of God. We are an ascending church. God, I, I'm 100% behind Rob in his view that God is going to do something great here. Good, isn't it? <laughs> Despite me being depressed. Okay. <laughs> but God is also interested in the individual. I want to tell you a story. Um, it's about a chap who lived in the 1800s. 
he had a name. His name was Horatio Sford. He was um, an elder in the Presbyterian Church, and the Presbyterian Church was a hugely amount more lively than it is then and it is now in most places. He was a lawyer. He was a successful property investor. And during 1871, he lost most of his money when the Great Fire of Chicago ripped through the place and destroyed a lot of things. Around the same time, his son, who he loved very much, died of scarlet fever. And a little while later, he thought, well, maybe the family would enjoy a holiday. So he put his wife and four daughters on a boat to the UK, and he planned to go. He had to stay and do some business, just finish some business up before going and joining them. On the way to the UK in this boat, there was a huge accident. A steel boat ran into the wooden boat, and 240 people lost their lives, including his four daughters. His wife, Anna, when she got to the UK, sent a message, I alone survived. What should I do? He got on a boat to go and join her, and the captain of the boat that he was on knew about what had happened to his family. And as they crossed the point where the collision happened, the captain called this man up and said, this is where the accident happened. And as he thought about his daughter, he was suddenly filled with words of comfort and peace. And he wrote the words down. And those words were, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot that has taught me to know, it is well, it is well with my soul. Liz and I have walked through some really, really difficult times. And we've walked through difficult times with friends and people that we've loved and pastored. The one thing I will say, I mean, I'm talking about tragedies is that having walked through those, I have seen God be faithful every time. Especially when people incline their hearts to him in their greatest need. Lost them. I want to tell you another story. It's about an individual. Her name's Joe, and I've lost it. Oh, there it is. So I went up to the Sunshine Coast four months ago and ran set free, and I did a healing service on the Sunday morning. And this lady got up and responded, and she was healed instantly of OCD. She was 41 years old, and she'd had it since she was eight years old. She'd had intrusive thoughts. She'd had um, terrible agony in her life. And then I went back to get COVID and also run set free, and this lady did set free. And this is what she said. She, she texted me just last week. Life has, life has changed so much for me since the set free weekend. I have continued clarity and peace of mind, no OCD or mental affliction. Amazing. It gets better, because when I did the Set Free Weekend with her, her physical health was not good. She had some kind of, um, something wrong with her systems. <laughs> They're really bad things. My physical health is improving. My husband and my marriage has been transformed. My desire to please people and my fear of man is gone. This is huge. And I'm more focused and intentional in every way. God is speaking to my heart and giving me words, scriptures, etc. It's been a wild ride, but awesome. Hope to catch up soon. That's the peace of God. That's what it means when the Prince of Peace comes into our lives. And you know what? He's there for us all. This next session is entirely inspired by Steph. 
When Steph spoke a little while ago about um, children being images of God, it was a revelation to me. God talked to me so deeply. Because I'd always read that passage and thought, oh yeah, we just need simple faith. That we just need childlike faith. That's what it's talking about. But Steph brought into the view that there would actually possibly be a lot more that um, that, that would entail. So I want to show you a little video. It's a video of my grandson. His name, his name is Otis, Otis, and I have his parent permission to show this. <laughs> He's got the moves. <laughs> Um, when I look at that video, and when I'm with this young person, the one thing I see in him is peace. I mean, I see lots of other things, but the thing that I saw him through that video was peace. He's obviously having a bit of joy there and a bit of fun, but he's not striving to be somebody else. He's not striving to please somebody. He's just being him. He's just being him. And the joy that that has given Liz and myself and his mum and dad has been amazing. And I think the joy that we give God when we are ourselves, with our hearts inclined towards him, taking risks, doing the stuff, reaching out, brings God huge joy. I think it is the joy that Jesus saw on the way to the cross and the reason he went through the cross. Because we can bring joy to God. That's a really far-reaching thought, isn't it? I want to close now with an invitation. Can you put the last... I think finding peace is about two main things. It's about having a real trust for God, regardless of your situation and regardless of where you find yourself. And it's about communicating with him. It's about, some people call it prayer. I call it communicating with him or chatting to him because I don't do prayer very well. But I do chat to him quite a bit. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehensions, I'm sorry, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I would like to invite you this morning to assume whichever position you like to assume when you're receiving from God, whether that's standing, sitting, lying, standing on your head, dancing, whatever. And I'm just going to ask God to come and give us a new revelation of his peace and his life and his love for each one of us and fresh freshness, just a freshness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you. Holy Spirit, we just ask that right now you would move amongst us. Lord Jesus, where this morning there are people in this room who suffer from anxiety and fear and have mountains in their lives that seem insurmountable, I ask, Lord God, that right now, in this moment in time, you would put your perspective in their heart. 